Kingsway Fellowship. Welcome. Today is going to be a great day. What an awesome day to be in the house of the Lord. If you are a visitor today, I want to personally say that Troy and I welcome you. We are so glad to have you, and I want you to make yourself at home. I, we have a few announcements. The first one is next Sunday, during the 9 and the 11 o'clock services, we are having a baptism. So if you've been saved recently, or maybe you've been saved a long time and haven't been baptized, sign up out in the foyer. Next, we need to talk about, about BBS, or as Alex used to call it, BBS. BBS. <laughs> BBS is coming up June 20th. June 20th. Get that on your calendars now. It goes Monday through Friday, 6.30 to 9.30, ev or 9 o'clock, I'm sorry, every night, 6.30 to 9 o'clock. It is going to be a great, great time. My kids are so excited already. Yeah, they cannot wait. It, it is just an exciting time. The kids have lots of fun, but they also get to worship and they get to learn about Jesus. If you've got grandkids, your children, nieces, nephews, you need to get them here the week of June 20th because it is going to be fabulous. Don't miss it. Okay, come here. Shh. Be very quiet about this. Pastor Troy, Pastor Troy turns 40 June 40. the 4th. I thought he was 50. Yeah, he looks it, but June the 4th, he turns 40. And so we are going to have cake and punch June the 5th on Sunday evening at 4.30 over in the youth building, just some cake and punch. We just want to be able to celebrate with you guys this monumental birthday of 40. Shh. Don't tell him. He doesn't know. I'm keeping him back we in his office. We got him in the back room now, Shh. locked up yes. in the closet. <laughs> Tied up. Ushers will let him out when it's time to <laughs> preach. So be there. We'll see you then. Hey, I am very excited about this morning. It's time to worship the Lord. And today, our, our teen worship band is going to lead in worship. So I want you to get behind them. I want you to praise the Lord today. And let's worship the Lord together with our teen worship band.
thank you, God, for that unconditional love, Father God. Hallelujah, we worship you, Jesus. We thank you, God, for that love, God, that had you sent your son to die for us that we may be with you.
significant that it might seem to someone else the Father cares about every single thing that we face and every single problem that we go through. And so this morning, I want you guys to sing that again. Start with that second verse. But if you have a problem in your life, if you have a mountain that seems big, even if it seems small to most people, but it's a problem that you're facing, I want you to come up here. The elders and the staff are going to pray with you. We're going to lay our hands and we are going to believe for the Father who cares and loves you to move in your situation and in your life. So if that's you, if you have something, if you need God to move in your life, step out of your seat and come up here. It's a biblical command. Worship the Lord and thank Him for His love in your life. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. Bless the Lord, all my soul. Forget not His benefits. Who forgives all my sins. Who heals me of all my diseases. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. people praying here's what I want to do first I want to ask a question how many people you don't have to raise your hand but how many people here know the Lord let me ask you this you don't have to raise your hand but if you want to you can how many people pray every day okay Sunday is no different than that have you ever have you ever prayed for somebody I want to teach you something this morning church is not a spectator sport let me say that again church is not a spectator sport there are people with this altar that need, need help from God. They need answered prayer. The Bible says this. Let's just do what the Bible says. Let me teach you something. The Bible says, bear one another's burdens. Uh, do we do that? I mean, do we really do that? Bear one another's burdens. One way we can do that is this. There are people praying. If you are a Christian and you pray every day, guess what? You are qualified to come and bear your brother and sister. So here's what I want to do. I want you to get out of your seat. This may be different. It's just old-fashioned church. It may be different for you. But I want you to get out of your seat. And I want you to come around these. And I want you to pray. I want you to pray as though it was your daughter or your son or your husband or your wife or yourself at this altar. And here's what I want you to do. I want you to lay your hands on them. If you can't reach them, I want you to lay your hands on the person in front of them. That's called a point of contact. That's a point of contact. We're going to create a, pr a, a wall of prayer. Now, how many know whenever you're going through something and you need an answer from God, isn't it wonderful when someone comes around you and says, you know what, we're going to bear you up and believe with you. That'll be an important thing. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray. You don't have to pray pretty. Just talk. Just open your mouth and talk to the Lord. If you don't know these people, say, Lord, you know them. And I want you to pray for them right now. Will you do that? Heavenly Father. I thank you and I praise you for your faithfulness. I thank you and I praise you for your faithfulness. And we lay our hands on one another. And I pray that you'll meet the need right now. I pray that your love would overshadow them right now. Jesus, would you heal people in their body? Would you touch people in their mind? Would you, would you encourage those that are discouraged and lift those that are down? God, would you, would you move supernaturally right now? Meet the need, Jesus. May, may every person at this altar realize that they're not alone, that you're with them and that we're with them. I pray that every person at this altar right now will feel the warmth of your love and the warmth of our hands. And just like in the Bible, when they laid hands on people and they received healing and they received help, I pray that this morning they'll receive that same healing and that same kind of help. Blessed Holy Spirit of God, would you move?
Jesus, right now? Would you move, Jesus, right now? Come on, lift them up. Lift them up and pray. Just ask him, just ask God to meet their need as if it was your son or your daughter. Ask God to meet their need as if it were someone in your family. God, you know what they need today. You know what they need today, Jesus. Meet them, I pray. Meet their need, I pray. Do it, Jesus. Do it, Jesus. Continue to pray with them. Thank you, Jesus. Now, as we're, as we're praying, I want someone to do something for me. I want someone to do something for me. Um, in the 9 o'clock service, I had the elders anoint Alex and pray with him. And uh, he's been having some stomach problems. I, we don't know what's going on the last few days. I almost took him to the emergency room last night. We've been praying for him. How many know God is able to heal? Amen. I said, do you believe God is able and willing to heal? I want, someone, I want someone to come stand in for Alex right now and let's pray. I just want some people, some, some, okay, thank you, sir. Now, will some of you gather around him and I want you to pray for my son. Pray that God will touch his body and heal him. And uh, he's been writhing, I mean literally writhing in pain. And uh, you said you prayed in the 9 o'clock service and we believed. And guess what? I'm praying the 11 o'clock service and I'm believing now. Will you, will you guys agree with me right now that God's going to heal him? He's laying right back there in the in my office and I want you to pray right now Father I lay my hands on my brother and you know my little boy God you know the pain that is in you know what he's going through you know what he's feeling right now we don't know what it is but Jesus you know exactly what it is if it's a virus you can heal it Lord if it's a flu bug you can heal it if it's if it's anything God you can heal it even if it were his appendix God you can heal it whatever it may be I pray right now in the name of Jesus that that stomach ache will go away and that you'll heal his body. God, lift him up off of that, that couch back there and make him feel better. That he's running around playing like Spider-Man again. Jesus, do it right now. We receive it by the stripes of Christ. We are healed. By the stripes of Christ, we are healed. And we receive it now and claim it now. In Jesus' name, it's done. In Jesus' name, it's already done. We thank you, Lord, for healing right now. It's already done. We thank you for meeting every need at this altar. It's already done. Come on and give the Lord a shout of praise and thank him for what he's doing. Praise him. You say, I haven't seen it yet. Well, praise him like it's already done. If, does anybody need anything from God? Do you need anything from God? I want you to take about 30 seconds and praise God like you're going to praise Him when He gives you what you're asking Him for. Hallelujah! Glory! Glory! Come on, is that what you're going to do when He meets the need? Hallelujah! We praise you, Lord. We glorify you, God. Bless the name of the Lord. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Well, why don't you love on someone around you? Give them a big hug. Let them know that you love them, that God loves them. You continue to pray as long as you want at this altar. You continue to pray as long as you want. Yes. Your dad said, hey, just a second before you go back. Just stay where you are and turn around here. Six months to live. That's what they're giving your daddy. What's your dad's name again? Larry, isn't it? You're, I thought you were a junior. Larry. Let's pray for Larry Sr. Yeah. You know, I, you know I, I'm at a great church. And, uh, you know, he's been fighting for the last couple of years. And I've always said, God has been holding him up. Because he's had a rough couple of years. And, uh, you know, back a few months ago, Pastor Troy and Elder Shannon and Pastor Shannon went to go visit him and talk to him. And they believe he's okay. And I'm, I'm praying, God, that he is. And I believe, you know, if it's time and he's okay, I don't want him to suffer. God, take him sweet. 
you know, take them home. And, uh, but if he wants to hold them up a little bit longer, I, I would like that too, but I don't want to be selfish. I don't want him to be in anguish. Uh, they, put two, they pulled two quarts of fluid out of his body and that being cancer. So, you know, it's, it's not just in his lungs, it's starting to spread. Uh, he's on nine liters of oxygen, which they got him down to seven, but it's starting to go back up. But I pray that God would sustain him because he's a great father. And I, I appreciate the church that I have and the pastor that I have. That, uh, you know, he stood with me and he's prayed with me and he's went to go see him. But I believe he's saved. Our pastor believed that he might be okay. That's what he said. So you got to believe him. But if he's saved, I pray that God and you guys would be in prayer with me that he would do what's right. You know, take him home sweet. Take him home. You know, my grandma's there. I'm hoping my mom's there. I, I was really young when she passed. I'm not positive. But there's a lot of people there that would welcome him. But if it's if it's for a selfish reason, I would like to have him here just a little bit longer. Yeah. But uh, yeah. I just need prayer. Amen. And that uh, God God would do what needs to be done. Let's pray with Larry and Larry Senior. I I looked at you. I'm a direct kind of person. Tina, Tina, come on up there. Let's pray. I'm a direct kind of person, Larry. When 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 we visited in the hospital, I looked him in the face and said, "If you you know, do you know you're saved?" Do you know you ask God to forgive you of your sins? Do you know if you die, you're going to heaven? I don't, we don't placate. And he said he did. And that's, that's all we can, that's all we can do is believe that. My dad was. <laughs> we didn't all that cry way back then. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, so I said, Dad, and yesterday, have you asked, point blank, did you ask Jesus to be Lord of your life? Yeah. He said, yes. And that's I it. Did. He didn't get mad at me. Good. Well, uh, that, that's a miracle right there. <laughs> because my dad, once you start talking to Jesus, he liked to just shut you down. But he didn't shut me down. That's good. He was sincere, and he was, and then that was the reason. Then the next day they told me I was going to Aren't you glad that God's able to save the soul? And he's able to heal the body. Let's pray right now. Father, we thank you and praise you for Larry Sr. You know God, his body. You know the cancer that they say is in his body. And we tell this cancer to dry up and die and for him to live and glorify his Savior, Jesus Christ. God, would you go to the hospital where he is and bring healing to his body. Holy Spirit, you know no bounds and you're able to go where he is right now. Save his body just like you've saved his soul. Glorify yourself in everything you do. And we'll praise you forever in Jesus' name. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing. By the stripes of Christ, may he receive the healing right now in Jesus' name. He's going to glorify you. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God for answer prayer. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You can take your burdens to the Lord. If the world from you withhold all of its silver and its gold, and you have to get along on meager faith. Just remember in his word how he feeds the little bird. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. Aren't you glad you can do that? Leave it there. Leave it there. Take your burdens to the Lord, leave it there. Listen to what, listen, listen. If your trust and never doubt, I know my God will surely bring you out. Take your burdens to the Lord and leave it there. How many remember that old song? Oh, leave it there, leave it there. 
Sunday morning. Isn't it nice out? It's so nice. And uh, I hear reports of 90 some degrees today, and I say hallelujah. Um, if anybody here complains about the heat, I'm going to smack you. <laughs> and if you complain about the sun, I'm going to hit you on the other cheek. <laughs> beautiful day. I'm excited about this weekend. A lot of people traveling. We need to pray for our brothers and sisters that aren't here. A lot of people are traveling this weekend. If I started to name all the families and the people that were gone, I couldn't begin to name them all. Uh, but we're so glad that you're with us. I also want to welcome everybody that's viewing on the web. Would you welcome our viewing audience today? You're a part of this service as well. We're glad you're here. Thank you for being with us, and uh, I know God's going to bless you right where you are, and the Holy Spirit's going to touch your heart. I believe that. I believe that. Ushers, I want you to take your place, and let's receive the morning offering. Um, you that are online, I want you to know that you can give right there at home or wherever you may be. Just click the tab and support the ministry. God's moving in this church. Great things are happening. Great growth is taking place. People are being saved. We had uh, had one or two saved. The altar line, but one or two saved in the nine o'clock service. And um, I, I think I'll say that again because it really deserved something there. I said we had at least one or two saved in the nine o'clock service. And that, that's deserving of a, a praise the Lord right there. Father, bless this offering in Jesus' name.
Like a man locked up in prison With no one to go my bed Every time I sought for freedom All endeavors would only fail There I was in sin's dark dungeon Bound by chains of misery Then the Lord paid me a visit Unlock myself, he set me free From the death of the pit I tried so hard, I couldn't touch him There in my despair, I cried so loud Yet it seemed no one would hear me Oh, I was so lost And so I'm done for sin And so corrupt God's hand reached further down Than I could reach up glad that God reached down so that I could reach up. I want to say that it's, I'm so proud of our teens. They did a fantastic job today. Didn't they? Those young people could be doing a lot of things. And here they are on this Sunday morning, worshiping and leading in worship. That's something we have. Man, I'll tell you what we should do, what we should have done, this whole congregation should have rushed this platform and worshiped like we were nuts. If for no other reason, to thank God that we got young people that are worshiping Jesus and trying to lead us to the throne. And they could be out doing God knows what this morning or last night or any other time. Thank God for that. I appreciate that. So talented. They're doing a great job. And uh, I, I told them earlier that after the nine o'clock service, someone said, "You guys did a fantastic job." And they're they're not only gifted, they're anointed, and uh, they're just doing. I didn't, man. I didn't even. I didn't realize, you know, I, that some of those guys were playing. I, how long has Eli been playing the drums? He's doing a great job. Been playing two years. And, He's doing fantastic. And that's, that, that's exciting. I don't know about you. That's exciting to me. Sometimes I'm beginning to wonder if you people get excited about any of that. Then, you know, this is something to get excited about. Uh, what God is doing. And then for them to allow this old man to do an old country song. Country gospel. <laughs> I'm reading this morning from John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Who ever said church had to be boring? I had someone tell me one time, I, they said church is boring. I said that's because you were there. It's, it's, bo it's what we make it. Huh? If you come with a long face and with no expectation, no praise or worship on your lips, guess what? It's going to be boring. 
I had someone tell me one time, they said, my church is dead. I said, well, why don't you do something about it? That's an indictment on me and you, isn't it? I think church ought to be full of life. It ought to be exciting. And I think we ought to make it exciting. Doesn't the Bible say somewhere there in Psalm, I believe 68, to make his praise glorious? Make his praise glorious. Well, I'm not going to preach on that. I just thought I'd throw that in. That's free. You got to, this is, this, you got to pay for this one. I'm going to have you stand. John chapter 6. John chapter 6. Verse 1. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he had which he did on them that were diseased. And Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was nigh. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company un come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Where are we going to get bread, he said. And he said this to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, there's a lad or a boy here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes. What are they among so many? Jesus said, make the men sit down. Now, there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number about 5,000. Jesus took the loaves. When he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples and the disciples to them that sat down. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. When they were filled, he said unto his disciples, Gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. This morning I want to preach in regards to this miraculous feeding. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your spirit that is here that bears witness to the word of God. And I pray that he will bear witness to our hearts today. God, would you anoint me and help me to preach? I realize my great need of you. So I humble myself before you, Lord. And I ask you today to put me on like a glove. Would you speak to every heart? Not my words, but your words. Change our lives. We'll praise you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. With the exception of the resurrection, this is the only miracle that you find in every gospel. This miracle took place about one year before Jesus was crucified. Jesus had taken his disciples northeast to, the, to, 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 to rest there at the Sea of Galilee, at the Sea of Tiberias. While they were resting, it says that Jesus looked up and he saw a multitude of people coming. They were coming to Jesus because they wanted him to, to heal diseases. And they wanted him to do miracles. Now I appreciate the fact that Jesus is a miracle working Savior. He was and still is able and willing to do miracles. And Jesus looks upon this crowd of people and realizes that they're waning and they're hungry. 
And so he does a miraculous thing. He takes two fish and five loaves and provides more than enough to meet everyone's need. He rectifies this impossible situation. I appreciate the fact that God is able to more than provide for his people. I was talking to someone the other day and we were talking about the situation that we find ourselves in. And uh, even with the shortages that are about to take place in America, with all the rain that we've had, even if all the farmers could plant now, there would still be a loss of nearly one state of land that they could not harvest. Listen to that. That's a shortage, shortage of grain. But I want to tell you this morning that God will take care of his people. There are five people that agree with that. F five people that understand what I'm saying. God will take care of his people. Listen, and it doesn't matter. He's able to provide more than enough for his people. We see that illustrated in this story. I want to take this story and just give you a few things very quickly. That we find, that we see. First of all, with Jesus, nothing is impossible. With Jesus, nothing is impossible. Oh, get a hold of that this morning. Jesus is able to take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed what some may believe could have been 15,000 or more had women and children been there. But we know that there's 5,000. Jesus is able and willing to do the impossible. Right. And let me tell you, that's what faith is. Yeah. Faith is not believing God can do something. Faith is believing God does do it. Right. Faith isn't believing God can. Faith is believing God does. Yeah. Let me tell you, I've, I, I know that God is able to save. And I don't know that he's just able to. I know that he does save. I don't just believe God can heal. I believe God does heal. I don't think God just can prosper. I believe God does prosper. Impossible situations. Maybe you're here this morning and you're faced with an impossible situation. Maybe there is impossibilities Financially, maybe there's an impossible situation in your home. Maybe there's an impossible situation in your marriage. Maybe there's an impossible situation in your body physically. Maybe there's an impossible situation that you're faced with. Right now, a mountain that stands in your way. Jesus can do the impossible. Amen. Amen. He can do the impossible. It doesn't matter. Every day, every day you and I are living with impossibilities. It's impossible. You say there's no solution. It's impossible. I cannot make it. I cannot do it. It cannot be done. It's absolutely impossible. Well, I want you to know I can't take two fish and five loaves and feed 5,000. But what's impossible with man is possible with God. And I wish we could believe this. That you could step beyond your limitations and realize we're serving a God that's unlimited. Say it's impossible to overcome this sin. It's not impossible. It's impossible to overcome this physical problem. It's not impossible. Yeah. It's impossible. You remember Sarah? 90 years old, barren womb. And the angel of the Lord stands before Abraham, nearly 100 years old, and says, you're going to have a child. Sarah laughed at the prospect. <laughs> 90 year old. I mean, that's like something you read in the Enquirer. 
90-year-old woman pregnant. Yeah, right. Are you kidding me? That's impossible. And Jesus, the angel of the Lord, looks at Abraham and says, Is anything too hard for God? Is anything too hard for God? Nothing. The Bible says that Jesus was having a discussion about going to heaven. And he said it's hard for a rich man that trusts his money to get to heaven. But he said what's impossible with men is possible with God. Is it possible that this morning we could start living the impossible? You have a dream in your heart and you think, I can't do it. It'll never happen. It's impossible. With Jesus, nothing That's right. is impossible. Amen. How about the problems in our life? You, you, you look at this. Look at verse 6, if you will, real quick. This is important. Look at verse 6. It says here that uh, Jesus asked Philip, where are we going to buy bread? And Philip's like, we, where are we going to buy bread? If we had a bunch of money, still, still not enough. And right squeezed in between Philip's doubt, Jesus, it says that Jesus asked him this to test him, to prove him. Could it be that the problems in your life right now are there that God may test you? Could it be that the difficulties you're faced with right now could be there that he's proving you, testing you to see if you're going to believe him for the impossible? Could it be? I wonder what would happen if just in this room this morning, everybody here would decide in their heart, I'm going to start believing God for the impossible every day. I'm going to start believing God for the impossible every day. Yes. We don't do that. We live within the realms of our own abilities. Yep. We look at impossible situations and we look at what we have to solve it. And even though it doesn't work, we do everything we can to fix it. And right beside us is the one who can take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed 5,000 people. We say it's impossible because we're logically trying to figure out how could it happen. But I want to tell you something. God doesn't work in logic. Man, I feel like preaching this morning. God does not, listen to me. I want to build your faith right now. God does not work in logic. I remember when I was in college, they, in preaching class, by the way, I, I almost failed because you had to stand right behind the pulpit and you had to stay with keep, you know, within just a couple feet of it. You couldn't walk around. You couldn't raise your voice too loud. You couldn't go too soft. You had to be just right. And uh, I walked around, hooped and hollered and carried on, and I thought for sure I'd never get out of that class. I think they just let me out. <laughs> but in that class, they would assess in there, and they would, uh, they would, the students also would grade you, how you looked and your outline and how it went and all the rest of it. And this guy wrote on the summary on my assessment, he said, you're more emotional than what you are logical. And I thought, okay, I gotta be honest with you. I felt like he was just saying I was an, an emotional idiot. <laughs> you ain't got no brains, you just get excited. But then I got to thinking about it. I'm more emotional than what I am logical. And I started to think about the Bible logically. It's not very logical that God would step out on nothing and speak the world into existence and out of nothing came something, but yet it's not, log it's not very logical that Joshua would stay the sun. God would stay the sun for Joshua to fight the battle and a whole day be lost. But it's not very logical that three Hebrew boys be thrown into fire and come out of that same fire not even to smell the smoke. Not for, it doesn't make much sense that a, that, a, that a man be thrown among hungry lions and the lions not touch him and he lay on their, their mane as a pillow and sleep all night long. It's not very logical that the Son of God would leave heaven, take on flesh, walk this earth, open blinded eyes, call the flame lakes to leave with joy, raise the dead, heal lepers. Not very logical. It's not very logical. 
miracle that he could take two fish and five loaves of bread and feed 5,000 people. Does it make sense in my mind how he died on an old rugged cross, laid in a grave, and on the third day he rose again from the dead. And right now he's in heaven seated at the right hand of God the Father. Not for a logical, but one day the trumpet's going to sound and he's going to step out on the clouds of glory. And I'm going to go up, up, up to be with him forever. Not for a logical. Hey, but that's something to shout about. That's something to praise God over. That's something to get excited about anyhow. I can't fit God here. But oh, he wants real good right here. What am I saying? If he can take two fish and five loaves, your little problem is nothing to God. If he can take two fish, five loaves, feed five thousand, what you're going through, get your checkbook out and say, if he can take two fish, five loaves, you're going to pay my bills. If I'm trying, I'm trying. Huh? Stick in your pocket if he can take two fish and five loaves. All right. I'm trying to inspire you right now. Huh? What, what, what's your problem? Huh? Not very logical. See, we have got... Now, does God, is God against reason? No. God created the mind. We need to think. We need to be logical. Not, not, God's not against reason. However, God's not limited to reason. Huh? God's not limited to reason. Man, I'm preaching good this morning. Say this with me. With Jesus, nothing is impossible. What are you dreaming about this morning? With Jesus, nothing is impossible. What do you want God to do in your life? With Jesus, nothing. When, when did church become like this? It ought to be a place to be inspired. With Jesus, nothing's impossible. Okay, let me, let me hurry. I'm not going to keep you long. My memorial flower to you is I'm going to preach short. With, with Jesus, this is good. With Jesus, nothing is insignificant. With Jesus, nothing is insignificant. Now, you want to get that right there. Philip said, What is this? When we're looking at that. Peter said, what is this? When we're looking. John said, but what is this when we're looking at. I mean, let's be real. Two fish, five loaves. Understand. The two fish, the five loaves. The five loaves are barley grain. The cheapest you could get in that day. And they're not loaves of bread like we think. They're just little bite-sized rolls. And the fish are little sardines. Insignificant. You know, that, that's a puzzling story in the Bible. Have you ever thought about it? There's 5,000 men, and only one little boy had enough sense to bring a lunch. <laughs> I'm going there. <laughs> Norma said his mama packed that lunch for me. <laughs> All those men say, ah, we'll, we'll be all right. We don't need nothing. And one little boy leaves home. Mama says, listen, you're going down to hear that preacher. Elder Santa said one time, he said, what happened was, she said, you're going down to hear a preacher. It might be Troy Irving. You're going to be there for a while. <laughs> <laughs> you're going to need a lunch. This, this little bit of nothing, insignificant. I mean, it doesn't make a dent. Just insignificant. But put in Jesus' hands, nothing's insignificant. Right. Am I saying this well enough for you? Am I saying this well enough? 
see every morning you look in the mirror and you think you're insignificant. What am I? Who am I? What can I do? What can I bring to the table? You might even come to church and say, well, I can't preach like him or sing like her or do this or do that. I don't have anything insignificant. We feel that. We sense that. We think we're insignificant. Can I tell you how? Here we are, this little speck of clay. This little, think of the universe. I'm just this little piece of clay floating around a little bigger piece of clay. Think about this a moment. Here you are, this little, this, this little speck of clay floating around this big, bigger piece of clay. And God, who created the universe, looks down on that big piece of clay and sees you and says, I love you. You know, you know how important you are to me. You know how significant you are in my plan. Think about the God of the universe. 2,000 years ago when Jesus did this miracle, he looked down out of heaven and he found one little boy with two fish and five loaves and says, okay, for me to do something great on the earth today, I'll use him. I didn't say, I'm, did you hear what I'm saying? Every, every morning when we get up, the possibility that God looks down and says, see that one right there? I'm going to use him to do something. See that one right there? I'm going to use her to do something great today. They're going to change lives. You see that one right there? I'm going to use that one to change Claremont County. And that one right there, they're going to touch Cincinnati. See that one right there? They're going to change the nation. See that right there? They're going to change. They're going to change the Do you realize God right now can peer out of heaven and see this little assembly of people on top of this hill? And in the world, the scheme of things, come on. I can look into that camera right now, and there may be another hundred people watching, and that's wonderful, but think of it. Right now, let's be, let's be real. There's no world leader or president knows our name. Obama don't even know that there is a King's Way Fellowship Church. Huh? Let me, can I, can I, are you still with me? Now, see, Obama, he, he, if you're watching today, we'll, we'll call it King's Way. King's Way Church. That's who we are. He, he doesn't know there's a... We're, we're, we're insignificant. But yet the God of the universe looks down. He knows there's a king's way. He knows you're here right now. He, insignificant. We, we feel insignificant. This little boy. It's, what, what's, that, what's that going to accomplish? What, what's that going to do? Just that little bit? How's that going to change anything? What's insignificant, listen, what's insignificant in our hands becomes of great value in his hands. My life is insignificant in my hands, but boy, when I put it in his, what can God do with my life? Your life. Here's this little boy. He's got this lunch. This little boy, he's got this lunch, and he comes to Jesus. And at that point, he's got a choice to make. Let's be real. The, the kid has a choice to make because God never takes anything. Jesus is not going to take that lunch from the kid. He's got a choice to make. He can say, you know what, Lord? My lunch. See all these idiots? They didn't bring their lunch. <laughs> it's their own fault. They should have packed something. They should have brought something. See this lunch? These... These little sardines, they're mine. These little loaves, they're mine. He had enough. That kid didn't. That kid had enough not to feed two people, not to feed a family. He had enough. It's a lunch for a little boy. He could have said, "This is my lunch." Jesus, it's my lunch. And you know what Jesus would have said? You're right, son. Hey, you can keep it. It's your lunch. Huh? Let me just slow down and talk to you, since you won't let me preach today. Let me talk. He could have said, that's my lunch. And Jesus said, that's right, it's yours. And at that point, that lunch becomes insignificant for the multitude. It might feed that kid for a moment, 
But that lunch becomes insignificant for the masses. Let me tell you something. If you say, Jesus, this is my life, it becomes insignificant for everything else. You See, the only way to live an insignificant life is to say, Jesus, I'm keeping my lunch. Men and women come down to the close of their life, and it might be a billionaire. A billionaire. Listen to me. A billionaire. Mr. Rockefeller. Mr. Gates. And I don't know their spiritual soul. I'm not surmising. I'm saying hypothesis here. If Mr. Rockefeller lay on his deathbed, with all of the billions, if not trillions of dollars that he amassed in heaven. And it was all his, guess what? He goes out into, goes out into eternity and it's insignificant. Yeah. It meant nothing. And I'm preaching good right now. If we live our lives to ourselves, it means nothing. It's insignificant. And most in this room, that's our struggle. It's my lunch, man. It's my lunch. Sorry about the rest of you. But I got my fish and I've got my loaves. This is my life. Bless God. No one's going to tell me how to live it. No one's going to tell me what to do with it. My life. My lunch. Ooh, that guy's preaching good this morning, ain't he? Now where we are? And boy, when he gave that lunch to Jesus, what was insignificant became so significant that Jesus, listen to what he did. He in, in Matthew it says, Matthew chapter 14, verse 19, I think, it says that Jesus took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and then he gave it to the disciples to give to the multitude. Listen, he took it, he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. That's exactly what he wants to do with your life. If you'll give him your life, he'll take you, he'll bless you, he'll break you, and he'll distribute you. And the effect that your life will have, will have, there's no measure to it. There's no measure to it. And we won't know the full significance of it till we get to heaven. How many lives? How many lives have been touched? How many people have been changed? How many, how many souls have been saved? How many children have been... How many, if we truly give ourselves to the master, we don't even know the significance of it until we get in eternity. Are you still with me? Say, raise your right hand. I, I'm going to let you go real soon. I'm trying to preach shorter because of the day and age we live in. See, I, I'm, I'm from the old school. When I first started preaching, and even 10, 15 years ago, when you went to church, they expected a good hour of sermon. And nowadays, they expect a good 20 minutes. <laughs> I'm going to try to give you at least in between there somewhere. Is that all right with you? With Jesus, nothing is impossible. Nothing's insignificant. You may think that your life is insignificant. You may think that you don't have anything to offer. But I want to tell you something. If you'll place your life in Jesus' hands, he can take two fish and five loaves and literally multiply your influence. And the people that you'll affect and the people that you'll change. All right. With Jesus, what are you trying to speed me up, Randy? <laughs> oh, it's not Randy, it's the boys right now. With Jesus, nothing is ignored. Nothing's impossible. Nothing's insignificant. Nothing is ignored. Listen to what it says that he did. He, he told them, gather up all the leftovers. Does anybody else like, does anyone like to eat leftovers? Some things are better the next day than what they were when you first had lasagna, for example. You let that settle in in the fridge for about a day. Oh, my word, that's good. Huh? Beans. Soup beans. Feel the anointing of the Holy Woo! I feel the anointing. I feel the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Supposed to kick it in about right there, bro. Yeah, they're better the next day. That ham and juices and all. Get you some fried taters. You know what a tater is, don't you? Potato. 
cut you some onions up in that, some good old sweet cornbread, sweet cornbread, not the bitter stuff, sweet cornbread. Some mixed greens, yeah. Oh, hallelujah. Now, why does the preacher always have to talk about that stuff right before lunch? <laughs> he said, gather up all the leftovers. And they gathered them up, and there were 12 baskets left over. Twelve of them. Now, the Bible doesn't say what he did with them. But there's some, we can surmise by the tenor and tone of Scripture. He could have given them to the disciples, their twelve disciples, for the effort, for the work that you put in today. You'll get a basket of food. But I don't believe that's what he did. You know what I think he did? I think because this is consistent with scriptural teaching. I think he got that little boy aside and said to the disciples, now you go home with him, and you guys walk right behind him. When that little boy went home that gave his lunch, 12 disciples walked behind him with 12 baskets full of food. Can you imagine what it must have been when that little boy walked in and carton behind him are 12 baskets of food? He said, what makes you think that? Because Jesus said, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. He said, try it. Prove me. Try me. See if I won't open the windows of heaven, and there won't be room enough to contain the blessing. Isn't that the book? That little boy gave it, and he got 12 baskets in return. Give and it shall be given. I believe that. Children, I think if we'll give our lives totally to him, he gives our life back a hundredfold. If we give our finances to him, he gives it back. Hmm? You can't outgive God. He's not going to be outmatched. Hmm? Isn't it amazing how he takes that little lunch that the little boy gave him, uses it to feed 5,000 people, and then sends the boy home with more blessing than what he had when he showed up? That's God. Only God does that kind of thing. Huh? I remember when I was in college. Let me close it with this. When I was in college, I went, when I went, let me start, when I went to school, my mama didn't have nothing to give me. And uh, when, when I went, the Lord called me to preach, and I went to a private college. And that was twice as much money to go to private college than a state school. I, had, I didn't have no money, no way to pay for it, but I believed God. I said, God, I've given you my life. I'm trusting you to take care of me. I'm trusting you to provide for me. And uh, I remember one, in, in, one thing in particular when I was in school. And it's just amazing how God would provide for me. I can't even explain it. My first year, I preached and worked a job and went to school. My second year, I said, Lord, I'm going to step out in faith, and I'm just going to believe you to open doors for, for ministry, and then the finances would come in to pay for everything. I was 19 years old. And, and from my sophomore year to my senior year, I preached somewhere between 120 and 130 revival meetings and camp meetings. Now, that's every night of preaching in the week. That was back when they had week-long revivals and camps and all that. And God opened up doors. I didn't have a business card. I never called anybody and asked. I've never called people, can I come to your church and preach? I don't do that. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to do that, but I never had a business card. And I still, I still don't have a business card for my ministry. Here, here, I'm pastor, so I don't do it. Because God called me, and I felt like he had opened the doors. I didn't want to preach. And in my mind, if nobody asked me, I won't have to. <laughs> well, bless your heart, that plan backfired. <laughs> I've never had to ask. God's always had a place for me to preach. I believe he always will. And he opened up so many doors. But I remember I had, uh, I had a lot of my bills paid. Had a little junk car. Had some clothes. Someone gave me some suits. I was paying my school bill. And at this certain day, I had all my books that I needed for college. And I had $400 in the bank. That's all I had to my name, $400. And I went in chapel service, and the professor got up, and he said, uh, he said, 
we're having a mission trip to Honduras and we're raising money. He said, the problem is we got to have $400 by tomorrow. And if we don't get $400 by tomorrow, we'll have to cancel the mission trip. And uh, the Lord spoke to me. He said, Troy, they need $400. And you have $400. And I said, Lord, that's my lunch. No, no, no. That's my lunch. He said, they need $400. And you have $400. Give it. And I had a choice. Do I hold on to my fishes and loaves? Are you still in the building? Or do I give it? You know what I did? I said, God, I started this thing with nothing. I don't have anything. And it's easy to give everything when you don't have nothing. Hmm? When I started, I said, God, everything I have is yours. Well, I didn't have nothing. But now he's asking me for $400, and I got that. <laughs> you guys are ready to leave, aren't you? And I said, all right, God, I'll give it. And I went to the bank. I said, started this thing with nothing, and everything I have is yours. And I went to the bank, and I drew out my $400. And I said, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make it, but you're going to take care of it. I put it in an envelope, and I slid it under the door. And the next day, the professor got up in chapel. He said, the Lord provided. I don't know how this happened. I was talking to college students. I don't know where it come from, but the Lord provided. And we've got the money. We can go on the mission trip. And I said, yeah, and I ain't got no lunch. <laughs> yeah. About a year later, I was preaching, a scheduled to preach a camp meeting up in Michigan. My own car was wore out. You could spit through the floorboard. I mean, it was junk. It wouldn't run. It was a mess. I was driving that thing around preaching. <laughs> and uh, I had to borrow a car to get to Michigan to preach that camp meeting. And I, I preached that camp meeting. At the end of the week, the guy that headed up the camp came to me. He said, we have a check for you for preaching. We appreciate you coming. He said, but there's something else, and I'm not sure I understand it, but he said, we've got a guy here in this, this uh, church that, that owns a car lot. And the Lord spoke to him and said, we ought to give you a car. And I told him, you have a good car. And I said, well, actually, sir, I had to borrow that car to get here. My car is gone. And he said, well, the Lord spoke to him and said, we're going to give you a car. And so I said, are you serious? And he said, we're serious. God said to give you a car, and we're going to give you a car. And I said, well, I can't drive it and my car. He said, no, you're going back to college, and next week we'll bring it to you. And the next week they brought that car from Michigan down to Ohio and brought that car to me. And it valued about ten or $12,000. Back in the early 90s, that's a pretty good car. huh? And I drove that car around preaching the gospel for I can't tell you how long in that little old car. And one day I was driving that, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, son. You didn't have $12,000 to buy this car, did you? I said, no. You know I didn't, Lord. Might as well have been a million. He said, but you know what you did have? Your body said a year ago, you had $400. Oh, yeah. I really believe this thing. I really believe this. And he said, uh, you gave your lunch, and I gave you Give me everything you have, son, and I'll always take care of you. And not only that, he not only gave me the 12 baskets, but he gave me the ability to go and continue to preach the gospel. See how this works? It's, it's true. It really works. God said to me, I will never ignore what you need. With Jesus, nothing's impossible. With Jesus, nothing's insignificant. With Jesus, nothing is ignored. God will not ignore you. He'll gather up the fragments and bless you. I want you to stand with me, please. It's a little different today, a little different kind of service and atmosphere. And I felt so impressed to do the altar call just a little different. 
And here's what I want to do. I wonder who today would say this, would say, Pastor Troy, either you're unsaved or you've held on to your life, you're holding on to your life, whatever it may be, you're holding on to your lunch. And I'm, how, how many would say, you know, today, Pastor Troy, I want to come just like that little boy. You, you might even just be holding on to an area in your life that you won't let go and won't give to God. But I don't know, I don't know what it is. But I just wonder if there's someone today would say, Pastor Troy, I... I want to come like that little boy and give him my lunch. Say, God, here's my life. Every bit of it. Use me to change people. Use me to touch people. Use my life to be significant. Use my life to make a difference in our community, in our city. Use my life to make a difference in my neighborhood, in my area. Today, I want to give my lunch to you. That's your own call. A little different. You're not going to have raise your hands. You're not going to have to close your eyes. I'm not saying 15 verses of just as I am. I just wonder who would step out of your seat and say, God, I'm going to give you my life. I'm going to give you my lunch today. Step out of your seat and come. Anybody else? Just come. Anybody else? Just come. 